Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby, and today I'm joined by Professor Seard Kluting. Professor Kluting is Distinguished Professor of Earth Sciences in the Earth Simulation Lab at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And in parallel to a long and very distinguished academic career, he's also spearheaded European scientific cooperation and integration, most notably as president of the Association of European Cooperation in Science and Technology, or COST, and as vice president of the European Research Council. He is now the president of Academia Europea. He contributes to the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism as a board member of SUPEA, and he's a fellow of frankly, far too many academies to name. And last but not least, among multiple awards and honours, he was awarded, he was appointed Chevalier of the French Légion d'Honneur, uh, despite, as far as I know, never having ridden a horse into battle on behalf of France or anyone else. So, Sead, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Toby. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, today on this uh, very sunny day. Yeah, I'm sorry to make you sit in a small room with the windows closed for an hour or so, but uh, that's the way it goes. <laughs> so tell me, how does a Dutchman end up as a French legionnaire? I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, that was also quite a surprise to me, uh, actually. Uh, I, I still remember the moment where the French ambassador came to my office uh, in, in Amsterdam, where I was at the time as a young professor. And this was not that long after the, the political changes in Europe. And this was in the time where I was in the beginning of a lot of collaboration uh, with colleagues in countries like uh, Hungary and, and, and Romania. So countries on the other side of the former Iron uh, Curtain. And this was at the first time where we could do together uh, joint research on, on the full scale of the European plate. Uh, because geology is cross-border. This was a fantastic development, uh, also in terms of uh, coming in contact with very motivated and talented people who had also other ideas than, let's say, the ideas that were popular in the West at that time. So it was very interesting. And uh, he came to me and he said, well, you know, you are doing what other people talk about, but you are doing it. And then he, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, you cooperation uh, with these, uh, these, these countries, with the people there and, and through scientific collaboration. So no, no brain drain, but, but really to mutual benefits. And uh, well, I said, well, it, it tells me more about the others than about me, because I said, well, communists might have ruined the economy, but gave the people a very good education in general, and also before the time, there was already a tradition in these countries. Countries like Hungary, many Nobel Prize winners from these countries already. Countries like, like Romania, Czech Republic, very advanced. It's really a pool of, of knowledge and uh, research-minded people, which uh, is of great value to, uh, let's say, the Europe we are uh, building. And, uh, well, then our conversation ended with uh, his uh, question, uh, would you mind if he would pay some attention uh, to, to this? And I said to him, why not? And the end, uh, then one day the, the message came that I had received uh, I, the, the Légion d'honneur. So I, I, I was really very pleased by, by this and surprised, especially because it, it came from France, uh, uh, caring about what was happening in, in Europe at last, and to give it to a Dutch uh, young scientist. So uh, this, this, this meant a lot to me. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and how is your horse riding? How is your horse riding since you're... <laughs> <laughs> I have never been good at that. No, okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, so it's the, it's the kind of story of European scientific collaboration that I would like to talk to you about today. Um, but just before we get onto that, since you, you tantalizingly dangled a mention of the European plate, uh, you work in the Earth Simulation Lab. That sounds amazing. What exactly do you simulate there? Yes, that is at first sight maybe a little bit amazing, also especially if you uh, uh, have in view the evolution of our, our field. Uh, my field is Earth Sciences, and I'm particularly interested in, in tectonics. Tectonics means uh, how the plates are moving, uh, how mountains are forming, and how the Earth crust is, uh, is uh, moving up and down, but also moving in a horizontal uh, sense. When I started as, as a student, geology uh, at that time was, was very much a descriptive science. 
And uh, only later on, the field uh, developed in the direction of modeling of science uh, processes. And I've been very lucky that I could make a contribution in, in that direction at the interface of geology and geophysics. I was also very lucky that in the time I started to study, a scientific revolution took place in the earth sciences, and that scientific revolution was plate tectonics. That was the first time, basically, that we had a, uh, an integrated view on uh, the movements of the earth, uh, getting away from a stationary picture to a dynamic uh, picture. Ah, uh, so before that, people didn't realize that the plates were moving individually and independently? Well, there were some early ideas, let's say already at the beginning of the, uh, the past century, uh, but there was not a feasible mechanism. People noticed that the coastlines of, uh, of America and, uh, and the other side of the Atlantic fitted very nicely together, but there was not a feasible mechanism. And it was only, let's say, in the 60s, as a result of the exploration of the oceans, also partly as a byproduct of the Cold War, uh, where it was important to, to map the topography of the ocean floor, also for the nuclear submarines, that everything came together uh, in, in terms of both the mechanism and the observations. And what was very interesting also, that one realized at that time that most of the deformation at the Earth's surface to plate uh, at the plate boundaries, and this were, that was how the plates were defined as, as rigid plates, with the deformation concentrated at the boundaries. The attention was also very much uh, focusing on horizontal motions, huh? how plates move apart, how they collide in collision zones like, like at the uh, interface of Africa and, and, and Europe. And at that time, there was not that much uh, interest for the vertical motions. What was also interesting, that it was very much a, a Western invention. It, it came very much, let's say, from scientists in the, in the UK and in the US. It was not accepted at that time in, uh, in, for example, the former Soviet Union. Because the former Soviet Union, of course, a huge continental area, plate tectonics was born in the oceans and was not that very useful uh, to, to study, let's say, the geological evolution of, of a large continent. And uh, it was only under Gorbachev where basically uh, plate tectonics was accepted as a, uh, as a scientific discipline in the form of the Soviet Union. And I happened to be there at the time where a conference was organized by the late Lev Zonenshine, a really pioneer in earth sciences in, in the former Soviet Union, which was called plate tectonics in the USSR. And that was the first time that I met really people from that part of the world to develop a common view. And I'm still collaborating with many of them. How and, and this was a fantastic development, <laughs> and, and I was very lucky that this scientific revolution took place in the context of a political uh, change. Uh, Glasnost, Perestroika, and then later on, of course, the unification of, of Europe. And uh, what, what I have been doing very much is to bring plate tectonics uh, to, the, to the continents. And not only uh, studying, let's say, the, the horizontal motions, uh, of the plates, but very much the vertical motions. So I became very interested in earth topography, how sedimentary basins develop, uh, which are mankind's largest resource of, uh, of energy and fresh water, how mountains develop, and also, let's say, in, in items such as what is causing the formation of mountains far away from the plate boundaries, uh, because plate tectonics predicted, first of all, that uh, the interior of the plates was rigid, so nothing should happen there. And we know now that's not true. That's very fascinating intraplate tectonics. We also know that we have mountains far away from the plate boundaries, like the mountains of southern Norway. This is very fascinating. Uh, and this can only be explained if we pay attention to the processes that take place in the interior of the plates. And it happened to be that a lot of the uh, processes are essentially coming from much deeper levels than we expected at the early days of plate tectonics. And, and today I, uh, I'm doing a lot of work on, for example, the interaction of plumes, which rise all the way from the core mantle boundary, but also, let's say, from shallower levels, uh, and the interaction of these uprising plumes uh, to the Earth's surface and their interaction with the overlying crust. And this work I, I do 
uh, very much in follow-up of a collaboration that started in the early 90s with Professor Evgeny Burov, Russian scientist, and uh, his, his, his co-workers. So this is very fascinating. It's also interesting that I started uh, my uh, scientific work by seismological observations of the core mental boundary that is basically 3,000 kilometers deep in the earth. I left that topic because I could not see the, the, the relevance of, of, let's say, that topic so much in terms of helping to explain geology at the earth's surface. And then 40 years later, I came to the conclusion that basically what I did at that time was after all far more relevant in the, in the context of the processes than I expected at that time. And, and something similar happened uh, in uh, the other domain of my research, and that is related to sea level change. By accident, I came to a tectonic explanation for relative sea level change, uh, which was attributed till that time uh, very much to waning and waxing of ice sheets and changing the level of, of sea level. But I, by accident, found another mechanism, which was the deformation of the plates and bringing them up and down. And uh, this was completely, let's say, against the, the common wisdom at that time. And at that time, one of the most cited papers in earth sciences was a paper by Bilal Haq on uh, sea level change. And I basically, I came with an alternative mechanism. And at that time, I could never imagine that, let's say, um, 30 years later, uh, I would write a science paper together with Bilal Haq, bringing our ideas uh, together and talking about inherited landscapes as an explanation for uh, relative sea level change. So my career has been full of this type of unexpected uh, surprises. So a lot of fun. So I've been very lucky with this, this choice for earth sciences. Because let's say uh, when I finished high school, I, I did not know exactly what to study. I was very much interested in, in history. Uh, but then I decided, well, why, why not study the, the history of, of the Earth? It's a little longer time scale and a, a little bit broader perspective. So that, that's basically where, where I came from. All right. OK. Fascinating. Um I, I don't want, I mean, we, I could talk about this topic all day because I know so little and it's so interesting to hear you explain it. Um, but just one question. So what are the outstanding puzzles? What's, what's there for the next generation of uh, Earth scientists to solve? What's not yet known? Well, when, when I studied, basically the paradigm was, uh, and the leitmotif was, study the present to elucidate the past. Today is far more studying the past and, and the present than to predict the future. What is also very interesting is that today we have a far more process-oriented view where basically we, we realized that earth processes can be modeled. And at the time that I started, the common view was, well, the earth is too complex to be modeled. At the time I made a point, let's say, that it's important to know about different mechanisms, whether they have a first order effect or whether they are a second order, just to get an idea about the relative importance. And it's also very important that if you do observations on a large scale for the planet, that, that you have basically a concept to be tested and that you have the tools basically uh, also uh, to put the, the observations in, in a context uh, where you can uh, basically develop models driven by the new observations. This is something, of course, that our colleagues in, in physics uh, have been knowing for a long time. And, uh, and I got a training as a geophysicist. I was, before I became a professor in tectonics, I was associate professor of theoretical geophysics. So I was very happy uh, when, when I was, uh, let's say, uh, 38, that I was appointed on this chair and that I could build up a group uh, bringing together field observations and modeling. And I was also very lucky that later on, I received a donation from Royal Dutch Shell, giving me uh, their uh, experimental uh, laboratory to, to uh, carry out uh, experimental tectonics. So with this, I, I had in my group three components, the, the field studies, both geology and geophysics, the numerical modeling, but also the experimental modeling. And that's exactly what we do here in the Earth Simulation Lab. 
which uh, is, is basically a lab where we model earth processes, not only, let's say, uh, to study fundamental problems in earth sciences, but also uh, driven by questions which uh, come up in the context of exploring, for example, geothermal energy or induced uh, seismicity uh, connected to the uh, uh, exploitation of uh, natural gas in, in, in for example, the, the Groningen gas field in the northern part of the Netherlands, which by the time of its discovery was one of the largest natural gas sources in the world. That makes perfect sense. No, as, as you say, like it is intrinsically global. There is no more global subject than studying the no. the, <laughs> the physical makeup of the world, yeah. right, of the yeah. earth. Uh, so, th but that's that's really good. So I'd like to zoom out a little bit because I know as well as being closely involved in earth sciences and the kind of internationalization of that area, um, you've also been observing and in some cases kind of leading more broad scientific internationalization and globalization of science. So looking back over your career, how would you kind of, how would you characterize the changes that have happened more broadly in scientific research in, in Europe? Um, and what's it like to be involved in those changes? I, I have seen that collaboration based on complementary expertise is, is key. It's key to provide a research environment attractive to the young people. It's, it's key to develop new concepts. And in that context, I benefited a lot also from the full support of Academia Europea, where I became a member uh, already in, my, my, uh, in the early part of my career. It was my first academy to, to, to join. And uh, there, basically, uh, uh, I, I discovered that there was a platform uh, of people who had a vision uh, to make the next steps. And that was very stimulating. But it was also very stimulating to meet people from other fields, uh, including social sciences and humanities uh, fields, where, where of course I was a little bit familiar with, but, but not by meeting really uh, uh, people of that, that level that I was meeting uh, there. And it was very stimulating. And uh, I, I realized also that uh, Academia Europea was very much a bottom-up thing. In 1988, it was founded in Cambridge by a group of people that said, we need a pan-European academy. Nobody told them to do so. It was their own idea. And I liked that very much. And it showed again that self-organization is the best way of organization. People who have an idea, a vision, and often that vision comes at a time where not everybody basically sees the need for that vision. Uh, but, but now, so many years later, more than 30 years later, we can say that vision of these founders uh, uh, is more important maybe even today than at the time of the foundation of this, uh, this, this uh, academy. So that basically prepared me uh, for community service uh, also in, in other contexts, like the European Research Council. I served there seven years as member of the Scientific Council and also a term as, as vice president. I have also served as president of the Cost Association, which is the networking tool uh, in the European research area. A fantastic organization, uh, which also provides the instruments for brain circulation. And uh, because also I have experienced that, let's say, that Europe uh, has been uh, a game changer uh, for my own field. And it was for me also important to see, let's say, that uh, here, earth sciences is not in splendid isolation. That it is a common uh, evolution, and uh, I think it's a fantastic achievement that today we have Horizon, that we have basically the largest public-funded research program on, on on the go, which has been really a, a game changer. Uh, and uh, when we talk about brain drain, of course, in the past there was a lot of brain drain from Europeans going to other parts of the world. And uh, with these uh, programs, uh, like the programs of the uh, European Research Council, we can also basically provide uh, fertile ground uh, for people to come back to Europe. And we need them for further economic prosperity, but also for coming up with, uh, with, with new ideas that can change the science. To what extent do you think those changes in, in science are dependent on the broader political changes? How much of that could have been done without the broader program of European integration politically? 
I think the concept, let's say, of uh, the European research area has been a game changer. Uh, and here we can think about people like uh, Philippe Busquin, we can think about subsequent uh, commissioners. That's very important. At the same time, of course, the scientific community was ready for it. And, and I think uh, it's very important also to realize we need the instruments. Uh, we need large-scale scientific uh, infrastructure uh, to be pulled. Uh, CERN is a beautiful example uh, of that. In, in my field, let's say uh, in the study of the, the, the oceans, uh, ocean drilling, very expensive. So you need basically to combine efforts. Uh, and that's on a global scale, but it also has led to integration in, in, in European uh, marine uh, sciences. Um, so that has to be driven by a community uh, that, that basically is ready for it, that is bottom up. Uh, and the same is basically, of course, also for uh, components of, of, of Horizon. ERC uh, was an initiative of the scientists, bottom up. A group of people came together and uh, said, we need a European Research Council. And uh, they did it. And again, nobody told them to do it. So I believe very much, let's say, in this, in this bottom-up initiatives. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we need also a vision uh, on, on the level of the decision makers that creates uh, uh, the tools uh, to implement it. That's why I, I think a dialogue between the decision makers and the scientific community is extremely important. It's very important, of course, also to realize that scientific discoveries cannot always be predicted. Sometimes it takes a, a lot of time. Sometimes it goes a little bit faster. And, and sometimes, let's say, uh, it's like with, with artists, sometimes really the people with original ideas uh, uh, struggle a lot before finally, yeah, it's recognized. Huh? A recent example is Kathleen Carrico, who developed basically the base for uh, the, uh, the vaccine that uh, basically is changing the world. Yeah, uh, this was basically a long battle for her rejection after rejection. And uh, only now people realize uh, how groundbreaking her contributions uh, were. Uh, and uh, fortunately, just in time. Uh, so I, I think it's very important to have a long-term view in these uh, things. At the same time, of course, uh, issues like our environmental uh, problems, health problems, uh, there's a sense of urgency. So here we have to mobilize what we have today. And sometimes that can go pretty fast, like the vaccine story. The base was there, but to basically put it in action, of course, has been uh, done in a surprisingly short time. So we need both. Uh, we, we, we need both. And that's also to some extent uh, the situation with the scientific advice for policy, uh, the, 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 the need to respond, let's say, to uh, uh, short-term needs. At the same time, not to forget the long-term picture and also to realize where we have gaps in the science. Yeah, I definitely want to come back to the, the science advice. It won't surprise you to, to hear. Um, and that's an interesting point to, to pick up, actually, about the balance between the, the kind of bottom-up scientific stuff and the, the top-down urgent needs. But I, I wonder, so it's interesting you say, and I've obviously heard a lot of scientists say similar things, that you have different modes of making scientific discovery. You have the very directed, urgent priorities into which we pour lots of resources. So climate change is a good example right now, um, where you want to make progress as fast as you can, and it's kind of driven down, driven from the top because there's urgent need to solve the problem. But as you say, there's also this characteristic of science that it's unpredictable and that you don't always know when you start asking the questions what answers you're going to find and what kind of spin-off results are going to come from somebody just piddling about in their spare time in a lab, you know, and suddenly discovers whatever it happens to be, penicillin, for instance. So it's clear in the first case what we can do to encourage it. We can put the resources in the right place. We can have a clear strategic plan and we can invest and make it attractive to work in those areas. What can we do to encourage or to kind of talent spot the second kind of research? How can we try and avoid the researchers who have got these bright ideas, which are gonna change the world, languishing for 10 or 20 years, as you described, through rejection after rejection and not being discovered? Um, how can we kind of find those and, and give them the rocket boost they need? Are there ways to do that? I think what is very important, of course, to, to maintain and further develop a strong science base, because without a strong base, you go nowhere. 
I have been visiting countries where I was asked for, for advice about future investments, where sometimes on the political side there was a tendency to invest everything on the applied science. And I said, well, this is not the way. I've seen in my own field how things that we have been developing here have been quite important, let's say, for the further development of geothermal energy exploration. But it didn't start that way. Uh, and of course now in the tectonics group in Utrecht, we have a professor of geothermal energy uh, who is also uh, a principal scientist for the Dutch uh, Organization for Applied Scientific Research and who is a former PhD student of mine and is one of the leaders in, the, in, in, in this field. So, uh, but it was the strong science base in, in general that, that paved the way. And I think this is very, very um, important. Creativity is, is crucial, but also freedom, scientific freedom in a broader sense. And, and you can see that in, in countries, let's say, where freedom is at stake, the scientists leave. They are the first ones. So I think it is extremely important to foster that. Uh, and, and also, basically, to accept uh, the risk of failure. Uh, in ESC terms, uh, uh, there is no difference between fundamental and applied. It's, it's frontier research. And in ESC terms, uh, one is always speaking about high risk, high, high gain. And uh, what is very interesting that in the ERC, this proof of concept scheme has been a tremendous success, a small add-on grant, but extremely successful and show basically uh, that what has been funded as frontier research can lead to unexpected applications. The chair of the group of sci uh, chief scientific advisor, Nicole Gobert, is an example of that. She has received several times such a proof of concept uh, grant, uh, uh, which, which is a spin-off of her research that she carried out in, in her main uh, ESC uh, grant. So I think there's a, a lot uh, further to be done at that interface. And, 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 and again, to have a fruitful interface, you need pillars. Uh, and uh, frontier science is, is absolutely uh, needed uh, as a strong pillar. Yeah, that's really interesting. Just as you were talking, it brings to mind, I don't know if you've heard the the, the famous um, policy that Google has of allowing their employees to have 20% of their time, so one day a week to work on whatever they want. I mean, they can stay at home, they can fiddle around with computer games, whatever they like, um, with a very similar philosophy, actually, that the idea is that if you allow a bit of creativity and don't direct all the work that people do, they produce stuff that is sometimes extremely valuable. I think famously like Gmail, the email service came out of someone spending their, their free time, as it were, um, to, to fiddle around. And it's the same kind, of, same kind of idea, I suppose. And at the same time, of course, uh, yeah, it's, it's also important to realize that an academic environment is just very precious in terms of the, the contact with the young people. Uh, for me, it has always been extremely stimulating to work with uh, young people and to see the drive uh, and also to see uh, for them how much Europe has been a game changer in terms of the, the, the programs like Erasmus, uh, li like doing, uh, having experience in other labs uh, uh, all over uh, Europe. Well, it's also interesting to see that this young generation does not take this for granted. Uh, they, they, they realize they have also responsibility we have people in the young academies uh, on the pan-European level, like the Young Academy of Europe, bottom-up, in national young academies. So I, in, in that sense, uh, I, I think the, the process is moving, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, it is to some extent, it should not be reversible. At the same time, it should not be taken for granted uh, because it requires also a collective commitment of the scientific community and, and the mindset of the decision makers uh, uh, with a vision. And uh, I think the European uh, Commission demonstrated this vision um, by uh, setting up the scientific advice mechanism, uh, making clear that it is a recipient, keen to be a recipient uh, of science evidence-based uh, advice or science-informed advice for policy. And, well, it has also brought the academies closer together. So that's a beautiful spin-off. Yeah, that, that comes across very clearly. So I have an interesting question, actually, about science advice. So I was talking a few weeks ago 
on this podcast to our colleagues in Finland, the Finnish Academy of Sciences and Letters. And as you probably know, they are just finishing off working on their own science advice mechanism, a new a new mechanism for Finland. And one thing that they said they had tried to do, Finland being a small country with a relatively small population, therefore, you know, not all the expertise they might need. One thing they were keen to try to do was, as they called it, to domesticate international policy advice. So when a, when a Finnish politician had a question or when input was needed, it wasn't just commissioning a bunch of Finnish scientists to go and write the answer, but they could go and find, for instance, a SAPEA report or an ESAC report or something more international and, and bring it back to Finland and apply it. And they said it hadn't really worked. It was extremely difficult. There were a few speculations about why that might be, but essentially just presenting um, an international report with like a cover letter to the Finnish minister saying, here's the answer you need, didn't, didn't cut the mustard. I guess if maybe there wasn't buy-in necessarily from the politicians, they didn't they didn't feel engaged in the process from the start, or perhaps it wasn't sufficiently localized to directly apply to their situation. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, or whether there is any potential for the process of science advice to be also uh, internationalized in the way that they were hoping. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, interesting question. Of course, what is very important is that yeah, it's often a matter of think uh, globally and act locally. Uh, and there you have to draw upon the expertise wherever it is. And I can imagine that, say, in the smaller countries, it's very important to draw upon expertise and experts also from outside that particular uh, country. It's also all a matter of, let's say, critical mass. Countries like uh, Germany uh, are an example, let's say, where we uh, have a strong academic community. Uh, both in, in the basic science, but also, let's say, in, in for, for example, in the, in the form of Akatech, uh, the German Academy of Technical Sciences, where I'm also a member of. And, and uh, I, I have seen how valuable their reports are and how much impact they have in the, in the German policy uh, making. But of course, there we speak about a county of 80 million people. And, and, and let's say, of course, also in the UK, there's a strong tradition uh, in terms of uh, science for policy ad- advice. That's a different situation, let's say, than for counties with a few million of, uh, of people. In many counties, there's discussion about whether they need a chief scientific advisor or let's say more something like the uh, SAPIA model. And, and uh, I think the most important thing is to bring together the, uh, the, the knowledge base and to have a recipient. That's very important, to have this dialogue. I'd like to finish by asking a little bit about the future. We've talked a lot about how things are now and how they've, how they've got to this stage, but um, do you feel like this process of, of deepening scientific collaboration in Europe is finished now, or is there more to do? There's certainly, let's say, it's it's on track. Uh, I mean, if you see now, let's say, the uh, the instruments for career ladder provided by the European Commission, starting with Erasmus Plus, uh, then the Marie Curie uh, schemes, then the ERC uh, grants, uh, starting starting grant, consolidator, advanced grant, and then cost as the networking tool. Such a thing did not exist at the time I was a PhD student. So this is a remarkable achievement. But it's also very essential to have this uh, and to further develop it in view of the global competition. If you see the massive investments in countries like like China with the uh, research infrastructure being built up there, of course, that is a very attractive research environment. And uh, it's it's very important, of course, that we we need the talented people here in Europe uh, because we need them not only, let's say, for breakthroughs in science, but we need them also as the uh, the science base for economic prosperity, because this is the domain where Europe can be very competitive. Uh, it is the overall high level of education in Europe that makes Europe uh, strong. And uh, it's union in diversity, that's clear, but of course the average level of, of European universities is fairly high. Of course, in global ranking, the attention is always, let's say, to the top universities. Um, and that we should realize, of course, that in, in, in Europe, uh, we do not only have top universities, we have also a, a very large number of very good uh, universities all over the place. And, and that's not the case in many other countries, including the US. 
so I, I think this sense of equality in Europe is also something precious. Not to concentrate everything just in a few places, uh, but to spread it in a way that it's, it's reachable for everybody. But at the same time, of course, also to avoid duplication. And, and that's what we see very much in, in the scientific infrastructure. But of course, something similar is happening also in the education to the schemes where people can go to different places in one educational program. So I think that, 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 that's a wonderful thing. And I would, I would really expect at this stage that, that this be, will be further developed. Of course, here also the further dialogue uh, with the future employers of uh, the people that are trained in an academic environment is very important. Yeah, I think this is a process of trust uh, and of interest uh, to both sides. And uh, in that sense, the work is, is, uh, is clearly uh, is ongoing. Um, so then the, the counter question to do you think it's, uh, it's ongoing is also do you think it's irreversible? Do you think? Do you see any kind of threats or, or counter influences to this process of integration that we've been discussing? On, on a European scale, on a pan-European scale, basically, I, I think the Union has demonstrated strength in handling a number of subsequent crises: economic crisis, uh, pandemic. It's in general in life. Let's say if you go through a crisis and you come out uh, in a good way, uh, you survive it. You come out stronger. Uh, at the same time, of course, we know also that in a number of countries there are uh, developments where we should worry about in terms of academic freedom, in terms of basically the independence of institutions. That is something we must be alert on. And again, we should not take the, the present situation where basically we experience freedom, where we experience politicians who are interested to learn what the science uh, can provide them as background for their policy decisions. Of, uh, we have a European Parliament that's also very interested in that, as, as granted. This is something very precious, and uh, as long as we realize that this requires a, a massive commitment, we should not lean back. Well, I think on that note, Professor Seer Kluting, thank you very much indeed for your time and your wisdom and experience. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Toby. It was a pleasure. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by Sapea. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko, so I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.